This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. This is my iron. You're going to acknowledge me. Welcome to the WWE Podcast, everybody. It is part two for the mailbag. And also, it's going to be our quick preview and prediction show for Backlash. We'll do that on the second half of the show. But I want to welcome a new patron. And that patron is Rob, who just joined us. Hope you enjoy your free ad-free everything. And if you want to join Rob, as it is now backlash tomorrow night, or really tomorrow during the day for most of us that are watching, except if you're in France or overseas, uh, it is going to be an early pay-per-view or PLE event that really I think is going to over-deliver. And we'll see if that happens, but let's get to the rest of the emails, and then we'll go to that uh, preview and prediction show. Let's get to Hungry Pup. And another patron says, I wanted to check in after the draft. Not going to go through my picks. Most of them are wrong. Clearly, I had misplaced expectation. I will say, if intent is to leave the roster largely unchanged, why have such a large draft pool? Seems an easy fix to uh, lack of the logic in the picks is to make the draft pool smaller. Maybe include only NXT and a couple of unprotected stars, similar to Major League Baseball's Rule 5 uh, draft. I mean, there's just no logic. There's no logic. They want to have a draft because they wanted to piggyback off of the NFL draft that was going on simultaneously. Except they didn't pick younger stars, which is what the NFL draft does. You don't draft existing stars. But then they also locked in the guys that are the stars. Yet the NXT picks were, what, five or six of them? (laughs) Out of dozens of picks it doesn't make any sense and then to leave generally most things unchanged and then they're going to violate the draft rules anyway within a couple of weeks you can bank on it it just makes no sense this draft i didn't hate it but it i don't know what it is i don't think it knows what it is or wants to be it's the most boring of both worlds it's not quite about really calling up young talent which is what drafts are Uh, unproven talent yet but it's also not about drafting the biggest stars because they're locked in with their title belts and one of them by the way exempted himself from the draft completely you can't draft the rock on top of it cody rhodes is ineligible all the every champion is ineligible and then you have them you know put the draft order in a way that makes absolutely no sense if you're trying to assemble the best roster it may, this is a very it's, it's a draft without an identity. But at the end of the day, did we get the rosters that made most sense? I mean, I guess. But you know they're going to be hard pressed to come up with new and fresh rivalries if they can't make trades if they don't do it, or they just forego trades and just have people come over from opposing brands with no one saying boo about it, which they've done many times in the past. Okay, let's go to uh, let's see another patron. This is from Freeman. He says, the draft was interesting this year, but more interesting were the stats given about each wrestler as they were drafted. It felt as though they were really struggling for relevant stats for some people. The worst to me was Jade Carbill's Cargill debuted at Royal Rumble and, quote, once in a generation talent. She has done nothing. It is expected to be a big deal. Even WWE can't point at any good stats for her. She can't be any good as she has needs to be babysat by the company's top talent. I'm falling off her real quick. Freeman, you know, it's it's funny you mentioned that. I meant to say something. I'm glad you did. I, I didn't read Jade Cargill's, but I believe it. I mean, what are they going to say about her? Former AEW star? You can't say that. Uh, she looks good. Uh, she posts uh, 10 Instagram pictures a day. I mean, wh- what stats does she have? I mean, that's not a credential to say that you debuted at the Royal Rumble. It's not a, it's not a pre-qualification. It just, I mean, that's not a, that's not a, that's not something you put on your resume. I agree. But what else are they going to do? They have to put something. And yeah, I even saw Nia Jax, even Nia Jax. 
I believe, had on their former model or model or something. Now, John, Nia Jax has been in and out of the company. She took a little time away, right? She was she was let go for a while. But for, what, the better part of six years? And uh, maybe longer? And she um, has former model as one of her statistics? One of her, one of her go-to bullets on her resume? I mean, like, what are we doing here? Yeah, is uh, and as far as specifically Jade Cargill goes, I'm I'm still willing to keep going with her, and I think most fans are because her look is extraordinary, and that's going to sanitize a lot of her in-ring shortcomings. But it, but that said, as great as her look is, and her entrance is, and her aura is. That can't be deodorized forever. That can't be hidden forever. Eventually, and you seem to be at the uh, the, the forefront of this, fans are going to see through what she can and can't do and that the, the WWE seems to very much be protecting her from anything longer than a two-minute match in the ring and anything more than four moves in a match. And I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not saying that Jade, you know, is never going to put it together. She might, but it's clear that they are limiting her matches because she's not ready in ring yet. And she has yet to cut even a, a, a promo that makes that grabs you. She's so worried about wearing the, the, the outfit that shows off her body the best rather than doing something deeper and connecting with fans on on an emotional level. Right now, it's very surface, and that surface level is strong, but it can't last forever. She's eventually going to have to deliver. The fans are going to turn on her. Okay, to answer your question, Rey Mysterio has been betrayed, been betrayed, six times in total. Eddie Guerrero, Chavo Guerrero, Batista, Dirty Dom, Santos Escobar, and Carlito. All three of those in the last two years. At some point, you just have to wonder, is Ray the problem? Maybe he is actually a deadbeat dad. I mean, can you give me one example of good parenting from Ray on screen? More interestingly, when the LWO were picking Dom on Raw, it felt almost as if they were a heel group acting as bullies, which made me think that if all these betrayals are just setting up Ray to turn heel and join Dom, rather than what we all expect to happen is Dom turning face to join Ray. Has there ever been a betrayal where the one doing the betraying stayed face and betrayed and, and the betrayed turned heel? I mean, nothing comes to mind offhand, but I will say as far as examples go of Ray being a quote unquote good dad, all you have to do is turn to the pandemic era in the pandemic era. I mean, it was it was I remember saying this many times. It was hard to watch. It, it made me want to throw up. I mean, I, I thought Cody's character was too cuddly and warm. Remember Dom and Ray backstage? I mean, it's, it's, it's just go watch. Every time before their match, it's basically like they were making out with each other. It was, it was, uh, it was difficult to watch, but obviously we've seen what happens now. And um, I mean, I guess that's a supportive father role. But, okay, quick point. I hope with Chelsea Green and Tiffany Stratton both being on SmackDown, they don't pair them up. It would hurt Tiffany's momentum and gimmicks. The gimmicks are similar, but approached completely differently. Well, right now, both women need help. However, Chelsea Green and Piper Niven were fun. They actually had, I think, a a very unforeseen chemistry. Tiffany Stratton does feel very much more like a singles uh, wrestler than Chelsea, who seems to need someone. But Tiffany's still new to the scene. She had a nice little moment at Elimination Chamber this past year. Fans got behind her. She does seem to be fitting in very quickly and very nicely. That doesn't always happen with NXT call-ups. But right now, they might need each other. And you know what? You know who might need them even more? The women's tag team division as a whole. And you know who's going to also need them? Specifically, when Jade and Bianca win the tag team titles, they're going to need a team to face. And I think these two could be that team. One of them. So, all right. Lastly, we can all breathe a sigh of relief that it looks like Def Def Rebel phase of WWE is coming to a close with comments saying they have heard and are acting on the fans' criticism of them. Rumor is their contract won't be renewed. I do wonder who will replace them as it is is difficult 
to do, and Def Rebel did some great stuff. But their formula is starting to become far too apparent. Too many intros start off with the wrestler's catchphrases before they go into the subpar generic sounds that all sound the same. And I hope their replacements put effort into the songs for the lower cards. Well, Freeman, again, once again, you dig into a level of these songs and intros that no one does. Nothing wrong with that. It's nothing I ever thought of, though. I didn't even know about Def Rebel and their contract. Uh, you know, th- there have been some very lame intros to Raw. There have been almost too frequent of changes to the introductions of Raw, the signature uh, that opens the show. But it's never been something that's been like a killer for me that I look at it. Even if it was the worst intro of all time, if they deliver a good show, it's like I don't, you don't even remember that, right? But you are talking about something that most fans aren't. You're digging into something that most fans probably don't even know about. And I appreciate that. Okay. Let's talk to, uh, let's see. Did I talk to Clayton? Well, we're going to talk to him anyway. Longtime listener, first time writer. Love the show, except for your picks on the PLEs. I know who to not place your bets on. Well, Clayton, let me tell you this. I, I have never portrayed myself as Nostradamus when it comes to PLEs. PLEs can be very difficult to predict. As the ones you're going to hear tonight, they're not easy. They're never easy. And when the ones you think are easy are the ones that don't end up turning the way you think they are. Also, if I become horrible, like horrific, if I become that bad, just do the opposite and bet on the opposite of what I'm picking, right? So in a way, I can be helping you because I can give you the opposite of what to do. (laughs) See, See what I mean? So maybe I need to become so bad that all you need to do is, oh, oh, Matt's picking Jey Uso? <laughs> all right, I'm going Damian Priest, you know? All right, <laughs> as far as people complaining about your views on certain topics, forget about them. There's plenty of people that agree with you that are just silent. Please don't want, uh, please, or people don't want to watch wrestling to see real world spill over into wrestling. People are tired of all these idiots. It should be an escape from the madness of what's going on. My only complaint with the show is that is don't over-apologize or don't over-explain your criticisms of legit issues within WWE. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I, I hear you. You know, sometimes I over overdo some stuff, no doubt. You know, um, I'm always trying to improve the show, believe it or not. <laughs> so I appreciate that. And, you know, there is a lot of people that I'm sure are listening that uh, that do agree with what I'm saying. They just I don't hear from them in the mailbag a lot. Most listeners are silent listeners. Most are. And that's fine. I'm not asking people that it's a requirement. It's not a homework assignment to anybody. But most are. Most podcasts you listen to, you don't write in, right? Most of them, I don't. I have a lot of podcasts that are on my list. I don't ever take the time to write in, mostly because I know I'll never get listened to or never get read because there's bigger shows. But also, I don't have the time, and and it's just I just enjoy listening to the content, and it is what it is. But I appreciate that. Okay. Also, I think Jade will be a dud. She was uninteresting in AEW and still is uninteresting. You can't be a stripper and tough at the same time. So I don't uh, understand the interest in her other than the look. You can't teach personality. Thank you for keeping me entertained at work and my, making my day shorter. Keep up the good work on the show, Clayton. Well, thanks, Clayton. I appreciate that. And you know, really, any criticism of the show, I, I really do take under advisement. I really do. I'm, it sounds like I'm being facetious. I'm not. Now, Jade in AEW, I didn't get a whole lot of time to watch her in AEW. I don't get a whole lot of time to watch AEW, period. I barely can scrape through WWE. <laughs> but WWE wouldn't have signed her if they didn't look her in AEW and say, hey, we see something here that they haven't brought out of her. You know, plus, I'm sure that uh, they saw the the money in her and Bianca Belair and they love themselves a good looking, strong, muscle bound woman. They do. And Jade has a very unique look that I do think is going to take her much further than most women who have impressive physiques could because it's even more impressive than impressive. But you're already seeing with this email and a previous one that things are starting to, the, the, the cracks are starting to show a little bit with even the, the kind of uh, like, at least the beginnings of that. We're not there to have the fans turn on her yet, but we haven't seen a very good promo from her yet. All she has done is relied 100% on her look 
and that's it. That can't be it, right? The, we will see through that very quickly, and uh, we'll see how much further they can take this before the fans go, all right, I'm done with this. All right. I think this is the final email, and we'll get to maybe a voicemail or two, and we'll get to the predictions. Levi says the draft format needs to change. It's most predictable. It's mostly predictable, unexciting. And over the past couple of years, more about the surprise pick announcers than the wrestlers being drafted. I'm all for a strict split of the rosters, but this can be kept internal and fluid for storylines when and where needed. As a viewer, I can piece together the rosters on my own as time goes on and ultimately forget about the draft results in a few weeks anyway. I'm writing this prior to Raw, but on SmackDown, three wrestlers switch brands. Andrade, Nia Jax, and Braun Breaker. So what's the point? Just put them on the other show, and in some program, we can just go along with it. It's not like they don't consistently break their own rules anyway. I understand the simulation of a sport as the concept, but my intelligence is insulted by giving the illusion that the picks are being made off the cuff and not scripted into the show. For example, why am I to believe that AJ Styles is a fourth-round draft pick prior to uh, one week prior to challenging for the WWE Championship, well, that's exactly what I said, Levi. I mean, it's just, it's it's absurd that you would have somebody who's challenging for the top belt in the company drafted in the fourth round. That's what I said at the beginning of the show: is this draft has no identity; it doesn't know what it is. And I do think that they would be much better off just having trades throughout the year, because the draft, if they're going to conduct this every year like this. I don't want them doing it every year because not much changed. You had some call-ups from NXT, but you know what you can do about those? Sprinkle them in throughout the year. Make it exciting. Have them debut at the Rumble, a couple of them. Have them randomly committed, you know, or not randomly, but strategically placed at SummerSlam, after SummerSlam, the Raw after Mania, big spots. You know, like have them do that. Um, you, know, you, you can have, you can even have vignettes of, you know, soon to come or, you know, coming soon, rather, this person, that person, create a develop a foundation of a personality and then eventually build up to their debut. That still works. That formula still works because most of the f- the fans that are mainstream fans looked at those NXT call ups and go, huh, who? I-, I don't know who these people are. You know, and I know with time we'll learn. But my point about the draft is if you're going to I just don't like the format of this draft anymore. Um, I know that, again, they're trying to piggyback off the NFL. I know that that's what they're doing, clearly with the timing. But we've seen the draft in the fall. We've seen it now in April. I mean, it's it's just, it, it can't find a place. It can't find an identity. And there's not a big shakeup anymore. I just, yeah, it makes no sense. And then the round picks make no sense. Politics clearly and outward perception clearly play a role in who is drafted at what point in the draft as if somehow a first round draft pick means anything in WWE. It doesn't means nothing. So, all right. However, I'm not going to complain without playing Booker and providing how I would change the draft. Use the concept to promote an episode of raw or SmackDown and do three or four rounds, one pick for each brand to draft only NXT wrestlers. This would bring more unpredictability and provide a real draft vibe. In addition, We'll briefly introduce call-ups to the casual viewers, giving the audience the opportunity to do their own research prior to seeing the wrestlers on TV. Oftentimes, I feel like as those call-ups happen randomly, a lot of audience doesn't know who they are, doesn't get invested, and then they're gone. That might be fixed with an NXT call-up draft. That's it. Thanks for the time. Love the show. Thanks, Levi. That's funny. I, I mean, I really didn't... <laughs> I didn't plan that. I, that. That was kind of my my suggestion, if you just heard it, was... Give these guys a foundation before you debut them. Because if you just have somebody randomly come out from NXT, most fans are going to go, you know, I don't know who this person is. So, I mean, you could do draft. When you do a draft, it's only for the young wrestlers, right? And it's only one pick, so it's not a lot of people. And then you have, uh, you know, your established stars stay where they are. And if you want to make trades, you do, you know, a massive trade announced yeah, they could do an announcement on social media, massive trade being announced on Raw. And boom, there's your little shakeup. So thanks, Levi. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Um, let's now get to, believe it or not, believe it or not, let's get to our uh, voicemails 
and uh, see who's up first. Hey, Matt. This is your neighborhood gardener, Michael Gross, representing Russell Magic and the whole crew that we are working on so much stuff for you. And uh, we've got a lot of irons in the fire. Unfortunately, it's Louisville. And uh, if you guys don't know, there's a little horse race in town that kind of distracts us or distracts me from getting a lot of things done. Um, kind of, you know, the tourist business makes things a little hectic. But um, I just want you guys to know that we're going to be working on stuff. Uh, Matt, you and I should do a show again sometime soon. I know we were supposed to do Raw off Mania, but things happen. Things fall through the cracks. Um, and I just want to say I miss everybody. And, you know, shout out to my partners, everybody in the Russell crew team, or excuse me, Russell Magic crew, uh, you know, Maverick, Rocky, um, Michael Patrick, Mark, Scully, everybody, everybody who's in there, and my brother Tim, who's recently joined with Mav. Thank you, guys, and we're going to produce you some more content. We're going to have some fun. In the meantime, guys, have a great day. All right, well, that is Mr. Michael Gross. You guys can catch him on Wrestle Magic. And, uh, yeah, it's been a while, so it probably should link up soon and, and do a show. It's uh, Life just kind of runs by, doesn't it, you know? Like you said, you, there, there's some horse, some kind of little tiny horse race. Like what's that? I can't remember the name of that thing over in Louisville. I don't know. Not a lot of people watch it. I'm, you know, it's, I, I know it's kind of a, a low key event over there. But uh, hope all is well over there. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely, uh, you know, look forward to that content. I know the Wrestle Magic team does a great job, and you guys have, uh, you guys do, do uh, crank out a lot of projects. I got to say, so I appreciate it. Okay. Let's get to our next voicemail and see how many we can get through tonight and move on. Oh, hey, Matt, it's Devin here from Australia. Um, I just watched uh, Monday Night Raw, and uh, the first thing that stuck out to me was before the show started, I think Michael Cole said that Bianca Belair was the first black woman to get a number one draft pick on SmackDown. And I was like, oh, do we do we care about that? anymore like stuff anymore like who cares what if you're black white yellow bloody green i don't care whatever like does it really matter anymore and given that this is a fantasy type you know um entertainment um or sports entertainment it's not like proper draft picks that you get in nfl and whatever do we really care about such junk anymore like, I, I don't know I might cop flack for this but I just think it's, it's so just stupid but anyway I was like oh god I wanted to throw up but anyway on the plus side um, nothing really changed with the draft picks either a lot of everyone just seems to be staying in the same place um, I'm glad damage control is on Raw because that could be fun but um, I, I don't know I don't really see anything exciting about the draft at all um, <clears throat> I mean not sure. I don't even know. And, and I was trying to think, you know, it's no use complaining if you don't have a solution sometimes. I don't know. Maybe that's just me or that's just what my boss says to me um, when I'm complaining at work. But I'm trying to think which, what would have been some good um, draft picks. So, um, I don't know, maybe, I think maybe it was good to stay on Raw and now we've got uh, Braun Strowman, who's kind of just like a walking dinosaur roaring at everyone. It reminds me a bit of my child. <laughs> He'll just be around there blowing spit when he talks. And I don't know, um, Braun Strowman, Bronson Reed, and Gunther, and uh, Ivar, the big lads there on Raw. So maybe there could be something going on there. But none of them can cut a decent promo except Gunther. So I don't know what would go on. But, um, yeah, I just don't know what would have been a good draft pick anyway. So, I mean, I was very unimpressed with the draft, regardless of who was number one pick or number two. But I don't really know what I would have done any different either, though. So, anyway, um, that's me. Have a good week. Cheers. Hey, Bevan. Yeah, I don't know what I would have done either. You know, if I conducted the draft the way I wanted to, here's what I would do. I wouldn't have a draft. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it because the way that it's currently constructed, it doesn't have an identity. I, I keep repeating that, but it doesn't. It doesn't know what it is. It's not really about new talent. It, it kind of is about established talent, but then you're having draft picks in round one and round two that make no sense. You're having people that are drafted in the fourth round that are main eventing your show on the PLE coming up. It's ridiculous, and it's all performance. 
and I, I know generally pro wrestling is, but they didn't even try to make me believe this is a real draft. You know, and again, uh, with, with Bianca Belair, you talk about a political, uh, you know, politics bleeding in here. And you know what's funny? I'll just mention one thing here, and this is gonna this is gonna light a fire on some people, but uh, this is kind of what we do here is just kind of speak our minds and uh, whatever happens, happens. Here's the thing. I'm a, I've said this before. I'm a massive fan of Bianca Belair. I do still want her to turn heel, but that doesn't mean I don't understand what she means to the company. She has not exactly had the biggest year of her career, and yet she's still drafted number one, and she's on the cover of 2K24. This is all not by accident, okay? This is all uh, very much a, in part, in part, a political agenda by those who have very strong political beliefs that own the company. Go look it up. Go do your research, guys. It's just what it is. And if you, oh, it's not politics, stop bringing it in. Guys, if you think I'm bull, uh, I almost had to bleep myself. If you think I'm BSing you, go look at the those that own the company. And go look at what they are doing, their, where their money is being funneled, what they do. It, it's, it's all right in front of your face, okay? So when, you, when people say it's stop bringing it in, it's already in here, okay? And what the funny thing is, the further we get away from the uh, like slavery in America, right? The, the uh, Af- African-American slave trade, right? The, the further we get away from that, it's seemingly like the 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 worse it's getting when it comes to that period. You know, you'd think as time goes on that things would be healed because time heals all wounds. For some reason, as time goes on with these things, because that's where it all is originated, right? With uh, with the slaves, the slave trade, and where all of the oppression that today we're told that black people have just because they're black. Then how does that like? We haven't had that in what 160 years, and yet the further we get out, the further we go on, um, the apparently the worse it's getting, the more oppressed people these people are. I, how does that work? <laughs> how does that work? Tell me how that works. Okay, uh, um, you know, like no one here, no one listening was a slave. Your your mom parents weren't a slave. Your grandparents weren't a slave. Likely your great great grandparents weren't even slave. Like you'd have to go back 160 years, and, and like even then you don't know for sure. So like, anyway, I'm going off the rails. I feel like another after dark episode's coming. My point about all this is, it's just as a culture, this is all like very, um, it's very, just kind of depressing that this is the topic that the focal point that we keep getting told is a, is a problem. And yet it was 160 years ago. You know what I mean? Like what, (laughs) you know, anyway, I think it's something that'll continue to come up and it'll just be a talking point. And I think there's a whole agenda behind that. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop there because I've already injected stuff into the show that I'm sure a lot of you are just like, Oh my God, here he goes. Yeah. Well, (laughs) This is the stuff you won't get on most wrestling podcasts or that they won't tell you or they don't have the guts to say or that's just not their flavor of their discussions. And that's fine. But I'm going to tell you the way it is. OK, because I pay very close attention to the culture. I understand what's happening. I understand the agendas of both sides. And this is clearly one that they looked at and said, oh, boy, yeah, we, we, we got to we got to make a we got we got to have a, a black woman in the first pick and then. You know how I know that that's part of it? Because, like you said, Bevan, they made a point to say it as if it's some kind of accomplishment. And no, I don't even think it was deserving if you just look at it on merit. It wasn't deserving on merit, which is, by the way, the only way you should pick anyone is by merit. And that goes for in real life. You know, merit is how you should earn things, not skin color. I don't care who you are. Okay, it's just that's that's how you should earn things. And uh, I don't think Bianca earned it. If this was truly a draft, she didn't earn the number one pick. Are you kidding? I think she might have been in the second round, like a top tier second round pick. But the first overall pick in the draft, 
Again, they wanted to be able to say it. They wanted to be able to say that a black woman was drafted first as if it's some kind of accomplishment, which it's not. It's not. It's just the company wanted to be able to say that to fulfill, a, you know, check a box and put it out there to the public. And so it could create some kind of news headline in the media. You know, that's what they wanted. So they fabricated it, manufactured it, and put it out there. Now, they didn't make a huge deal about it. They didn't say it over and over and over. But it was mentioned at the very beginning of the show. So they clearly wanted people to pay attention to that. It's stupid. You know, it's really stupid. Um, I got to say, if I, I wouldn't want to always be told that I'm a victim. You know, I, just, I, wouldn't, I, I don't want to be a victim. But victimhood has power today. Because if you're a victim, you're oppressed. And then if you're oppressed, you can say that it's the, it's this, uh, the system that's oppressing you. And then you're a victim. So everything you do is not your fault. <clears throat> you are not responsible for anything. It's not you. It's, your actions are justified because the system's oppressing you. You know, I wouldn't want to be told that. I would not want to be told that at all. And, you know, like, I, I think, again, I'm going to... I'm going to kind of put a filter on myself here now. But uh, I think, again, there's more to this than that. But I'm scratching the surface and I'm going to move on here. <laughs> I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Bevan, for getting me riled up about this. Uh, and uh, I'm sure all people heard. There are some people out there who heard. all. This is all they heard from me. Everything they, that I said in the last six minutes uh, is they heard. All they heard from me was, uh, I don't like black people. Uh, and... Uh, uh, the, the, you know, I, I'm racist. That's a lot of what some people hear, but it's just nonsense. It's nonsense. No one wants to talk about it. But if you, I mean, don't believe me. Take a look at the culture. Look around you. So, sure, whatever. Yeah. If someone called me a racist, I, I honestly would just be like, yeah, sure, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, I, no, I'm not. I don't need to prove it to anybody. It's just the most, it's the most overused, lame accusation today that can be used. It's lazy. But I'm not saying racism doesn't exist. Of course it exists. Of course it exists. But it's on an individual level, you know. I don't think it's system wide. But anyway, okay, let's uh, talk to maybe one or two more, and we'll call it a night, and then go to the preview and predictions. Let's go to Jason from Oregon and see what he's got to say. Hey Matt and the uh, WWE podcast world. This is Jason from Oregon. It's a beautiful sunny day in Oregon, and I'm just sitting here thinking about Cody Rhodes. Uh, Matt, I heard your uh, your rant about Dusty, and it got me thinking. You know, I grew up watching WWE back in the '80s era, and when Dusty was wrestling. And to be honest, I always thought he was cheesy as a as a young kid. I did not get the American dream. I thought he was just kind of one of those cheesy type guys. You know, I was much more into Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, and the Ultimate Warrior. And now here, years later, you know, I missed that whole, uh, all the other eras. I just came back recently, as I've said here on the podcast before. And so I, I, I don't, I didn't get that, you know, Cody Rhodes or Dusty Rhodes starting NXT and, Behind the scenes, I think a lot of people had admiration for him, and I can, I, you know, I can value that. And so I, I think that's where people are come from. But to me, it's kind of like if Grayson Waller's dad was one of the Bushwhackers, and everyone was getting teary talking about the Bushwhackers to Grayson Waller, and you're like, well, I don't really get it. I thought those guys were kind of cheesy. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, I think, you know, if behind the scenes people really value someone, that's where I get it. I couldn't even believe that AJ in his promo was almost in tears. But anyway, if someone's a great man, give him, give him honor, but I can see where you're coming from. Anyway, thanks for the great show. Later. Hi, Jason. Well, welcome back to the show, and good to hear from you. I feel like, yeah, it's been a while. And so uh, I'm really – trying my best to not go on a Cody rant again. It's been a while. He's been a little bit on the the DL as of late. Now, Dusty Rhodes is not... A, we've heard, for most fans, <laughs> Dusty Rhodes is the name we've heard more in the last year and a half than we've heard when Dusty Rhodes was actually competing. 
if for those of us that are, were alive when he did, right? He has become more of a talking point now than when he actually was wrestling in ring. And it was, is there been another death in wrestling in which has been more performatively cried over? I mean, I do think some of the tears are real, but a lot of it has been like very much. I mean, even Cody Rhodes couldn't fake crying. Remember that the promo before WrestleMania? He couldn't even, he, 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 he was pretending to cry, but he didn't sell it all the way. So it came off very phony. Um, and everything, again, every single freaking programming he's been in has to do with his dad. I Come up with something else. Forge your own path. Okay, your dad died. It is sad. Move on. But they're continuing to try to use it to pull at the heartstrings of fans because they know that if they can do that, then that creates an emotional connection. And then you start to feel for him and all the like, move on. I mean, if he's so great, why does he have to keep and why do we <clears throat> continue to use the strategy of his dad's death? Has there ever been a death more exploited than this one? Eddie Guerrero, maybe. But even that wasn't used as a storyline for sympathy other than Chavo when it initially happened. I remember Chavo Guerrero, obviously a sympathetic figure, but they didn't push him to the main event. Uh, Dominic. It was a it was a kid when that happened, but um, but was there a death that they really exploited as much as this? I can't think of one. I mean, Bret Hart. Well, he, I mean, he didn't die, but I, I don't I don't know. I was thinking that. I was thinking just connections of old stars and like an Italian Bret Hart, but obviously Bret didn't die yet. Uh, I'm trying to think of a death. Can anybody come up with a death that has been more exploited in wrestling than Dusty Rhodes? I cannot think of one. So, yeah, it's it's just annoying to me. And, um, you know, if, if Cody wants to stand on his own two feet and not be known as just Dusty Rhodes' kid, which I think, I mean, again, he's he beat Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. I would say he's made it, right? But, like, do you forever want to be always remembered as, as you know, Dusty Rhodes' son? You know, because... He has done things on his own, but like everything he talks about all the time, every time, every, like everyone gets emotional every single time they mention him. Like, I, I don't know. I, I know that he, I'm sure he's a great man behind the scenes. He seems like he was father figure to many, all that stuff. I've just never seen the same formula being used over and over and over and over. So. Anyway, Jason, yeah, thanks for the thanks for the call. I appreciate you listening. It sounds like you were in the car calling us, so uh, drive safely. Or, you know, if you if you do that regularly, make sure you're on the you know the, the speakerphone, right? So thanks so much, and uh, I will be chatting with you soon. Hopefully, hopefully, and everyone else will be chatting with you soon. Now, let's get to the uh, the actual pay per view here, the PLE backlash. So let's start. Let's see where do we want to start. KO and Randy Orton versus the Bloodlines, Solo Sokoa and Tama Tonga. This to me is a no brainer that the Bloodline wins. I do not expect Roman Reigns to show up. I do not. I do not. I do not. If he does, I'll be shocked and kind of disappointed, honestly. I mean, I'm excited to see Roman Reigns return as much as the next person to see what he does and all that, but it's not time yet. It's still a little premature. So. The bloodline wins, I think, by hook or crook or by a turn by Kevin KO or Randy. I could see an RKO on Kevin Owens or Kevin Owens stunning Randy. I could see a massive turn here, not for them to join the bloodline, but just for one of them to turn heel. But I certainly, certainly expect the bloodline to win. Now, it's also maybe that neither. Now, here, here's the thing. While I said that, that one of them could turn, what about a new member? As I think someone else pointed out in the mailbag last night. What if it's a new member of the, of, the, of the bloodline? That could be also be possible. So either way, no matter how you slice it, no matter how you try to pretzel this into KO and Randy winning, it's not happening. The bloodline's going to win. Solo Sokoa and Tamatanga need the victory, and I think they'll get it here. All right, the Women's Tag Team Championship, Kabuki Warriors versus Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill. This is, to me, also a slam dunk. Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill win. There's just no two ways about this one either. Now, what I would do is a, a stopwatch. Somebody needs to have a stopwatch to time 
the amount of uh, the amount amount of in ring minutes Bianca Belair, or I'm sorry, Jade Cargill has, because Bianca Belair is likely going to be carrying 80 percent or more of this match, only to tag in Belair. Or I'm sorry, Jade. Once, probably twice for the hot tag. Let's count the number of moves that Jade does as well. I would venture to guess five moves at the max and a total of three and a half in ring minutes. I mean, that may be overdoing it. So I think Bianca Belair is absolutely going to be the one to um, carry the most of the wrestling in the match. So uh, I don't expect a crazy good match. The Kabuki Warriors need to just, they need to drop the belts here, and they absolutely will. All right. How about the women's tag team, or the, rather the women's championship? Bailey versus Naomi versus Tiffany Stratton. Bailey retains another slam dunk. This this PLE is filled with slam dunks, but not completely, and we'll get to that soon. Bailey absolutely retains, and what I think could be a very fun match and really a, could be a breakout performance for Tiffany Stratton. Naomi's always solid in ring. She uh, does have, she's not the smoothest, I have to say. She does have her botches here and there, but you know she's never going to put on a bad match. Bailey, same way. Tiffany is, this is easily the biggest match of her career. There is no chance of Naomi winning. There's no, ch- I don't think there's any chance of Tiffany Stratton winning. It's too early. Bailey had overcome all the odds. She was the Women's Royal Rumble winner this year, won at WrestleMania. You know, she's not going to lose it four weeks later. Let's be honest. So Bailey retains. All right. Let's now go to the big boys. Uh, Damian Priest versus Jey Uso for the World Heavyweight Championship. Again, it seems like Jey Uso has no chance. I, I wouldn't say he has no chance. I'd say his chance is like 5% that he wins the World Heavyweight Championship. Damien does still feel to me like a transitional champion because Jey Uso is a credible threat. But you could also have Drew McIntyre chasing Damien and possibly winning it and then facing Punk at Wrestle or at SummerSlam. So Damien to me and Damien versus Jey Uso should be a fun 12 to 13 minute world title match that ends with Damien Priest retaining. And it could be because of Judgment Day. Um... I hope that Jimmy doesn't interfere. For the love of God, please, Jimmy Uso, do not interfere. But I think Damian retains the title, and that's kind of it. I mean, I expect a very, just a good, probably raw main event quality of a, of a, a match. All right, let's talk to, or look, talk to. <laughs> oh my God, I need to go to bed. It's almost midnight. The Undisputed Championship, Cody Rhodes, AJ Styles, again. Lock it up. Throw away the key. They wouldn't imagine AJ Styles win this match. Um, and just think, just just envision that for a moment. Oh my God, there is no chance, zero, that Cody Rhodes wins or loses. Rather, AJ Styles is dropping this, um, uh, taking the L here. He is getting dropped. He's getting pinned. It's the end of the day. It's not happening, right? Like Cody Rhodes is winning. He's retaining. AJ Styles has no chance. But, but, while I say that so confidently, here's what I think will happen. They will give us moments to believe. And every time there are these, you know, slam dunk, overwhelming favorites, they do give us moments throughout the match that make you question that confidence that you have. So, while there is seriously absolutely no chance AJ Styles wins this, we are going to get, I think, a very good match, 15, 16, 17 minutes of Cody Rhodes and AJ AJ Styles beating the hell out of each other, near falls, kickouts of finishes, as we always do. That's par for the course. Do I think there's going to be any interference? I hope not. I hope this is kind of just a straightforward event. And this really doesn't, I mean, this this event does not excite me a whole lot from a star power perspective, but it does excite me from a wrestling perspective, in-ring wrestling. And I think that's where this whole PLE will shine is the wrestling part of a wrestling show. Who knew? So I think this is going to be a good show. Uh, again, I would be surprised if any of these picks are wrong. If I was to choose one of these matches in which you could say, OK, this one might go either way. <sighs> I, I would guess 
it could be. I mean, I guess if you're going to pick one, it could be Kabuki Warriors winning against Bianca and Jade. And then they chase them a little bit more and eventually win. That's the one match. But even there, I feel highly confident. So this is a <clears throat> this is a PLE that I would not expect a whole lot of crazy finishes, unpredictable finishes. They just made their lock in decisions at WrestleMania. They're not going to backtrack on them four weeks later at, P- at Backlash, right? So this is not going to be the most exciting PLE when it comes to unpredictable finishes, but what the matches will do is provide great in-ring wrestling and have the wrestlers be able to deliver uh, and, and, and execute and do what they do best, which is tell in-ring stories and kick ass. That's what you can hope for, not the outcomes, because the outcomes just are... Uh, there may not have may not really be a PLE that I've ever seen that is so highly confident that I've been so highly confident about, but also it's not me being the smartest person in the room. It's just, I think everyone kind of feels this way. You know, just, it doesn't make any sense, really almost no sense for the the WWE to change any of these outcomes. But what they can do is introduce new stories, new people. The outcomes can be what they are and that's very predictable. But what you can do is introduce new people like a new bloodline member, right? Right. Uh, maybe a new, re- a big return, somebody turning heel while at the same time getting the outcome we all expect, you have a sub uh, sub story going in and things that happen off of those predictable victories or losses that you can build on for the next event. So if that makes sense, then I think that's what they'll do here. All right. Well, that'll do it for me on this mailbag part two slash backlash preview and predictions. Again, Tomorrow is the event, and I probably will not be watching it live. I've got so much damn yard work. I, I mean, so much yard work. Like I'm trying to grow grass. I'm trying to, uh, you know, we might be putting a fence in. We're trying to do some mulch. We're trying to paint. We're trying like all this stuff, you know. So it's just, it's just, uh, it's crazy, right? So I, there's just no way I'm going to be able to watch it live. I'll try to stay off social social media during it because I don't want to ruin the outcomes. But I will uh, maybe try to do a review show tomorrow. If I can sneak it in throughout the day while I'm working, maybe I'll do that because it's going to be a three hour plus show. Maybe I'll uh, try to sneak it in and then do a review show tomorrow night. (sighs) Fingers crossed. But you guys know how it is when I say that. Then I don't you know, you don't get a review show for like two days. Right. So I'll do my best and we'll see what happens. But everyone enjoy the PLE. Enjoy Backlash. If you want to go ad free and also get access to the Discord server with all the other patrons, you get that at every single level at the Patreon uh, exclusive site. So check out patreon.com slash WWE podcast if you want access to the Discord server. It's there. And if you don't have it, you can message me directly in Discord. I will send it to you and you can get in and chat with all the other patrons. It's been a blast there. I know you guys are very active there during events and it's cool to see, especially during PLEs. You can also go to Apple and get an ad-free subscription there. Both Patreon and Apple offer ad-free, seven-day free trials. So that's all, that'll do it for me tonight, guys. I'll be back, hopefully, fingers crossed, tomorrow night with a Backlash review. If not, you guys know Sunday for sure will be the weekend review slash uh, Backlash review. But uh, we will see because I'm also trying to sync up with somebody who's attending live, Alex the French guy. But... My schedule is so difficult and unpredictable that I, I don't want to have <laughs> have my uh, co host wait on you know uh, wait on the line and I'm not there and I got other stuff going on so we'll see I might not have a co host I might stay tuned that'll do it for me take care everybody thanks for listening to the WWE podcast don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. So you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.